Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran trying to sell off in bulk 10,000 CD jewel cases that you bought back in the mid-90s, or else a scrappy upstart. Having to Google the very phrase jewel case, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the third Friday of November 2021, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Jacques who drove a cabriolet with blue LED lights under the grill and who was always trying to sell you whippets for five bucks a piece. And old Jacques would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now. You guys, that's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. It powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. Listeners to the Working Songwriter podcast can go to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I dare to say that we're building something of a little community over there, including many people who are listeners of this podcast. So, Come on over and be a part of it every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Head on over to YouTube and search for Joe Pug or go to joepugmusic.com and click on the live stream tab. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. Uh, If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time to do that already. And if you're not in a place to support the show that way, that's totally fine. There's still a couple ways that you could help out the show for free. Uh, The first way that you could do that is by leaving us a rating in the iTunes store. Or the second way that you could do that is simply by telling a friend about the show, spreading the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Our guest this week is a standard bearer of American blues music who hails originally from California. Keb Moe is a Grammy-winning artist who has been at the vanguard of American roots music for the last several decades. He got his start as a sideman in live bands before working his way up to a staff writer and arranger for A&M Records. His solo career 
didn't begin in earnest until his early 40s, when he released a self-titled album, and it took him on to the national stage immediately. He's recorded for Sony's Oka imprint, Epic, and Rounder Records. He's appeared in Martin Scorsese's PBS film series, The Blues. He has won five Grammy Awards. He's performed with Keith Richards, Buddy Guy, Bonnie Raitt, Mavis Staples, and many others. He's even appeared on Sesame Street. Folk Alley has described his musical presence thusly. Joy is a commodity that is often in very short supply. In the past few years, it seems even more rare. Maybe that's because it's a state of being rather than a mere emotion. So it takes effort to cultivate and maintain joy in our lives. Anyone who's ever been in the presence of blues legend Keb Moe knows that he has found the secret to that state, perhaps thanks to his practice of living every moment as a form of prayer. It was a true honor to have him join the show a few weeks ago and a pleasure to hear about his journey so far. Mr. Keb Mo, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter Podcast. Uh, f- yes, uh, from what I've read, you came of age in a household where music was of great importance. Uh, what are some of the earliest memories you have of music with, with your family? Hmm. Well, that thing of, of the music being of great importance, that's been overblown. <laughs> I don't know if that's some kind of way a, a, a journalist or a, somebody got out of hand with the facts. But it wasn't not important, but it was important to me. So, so it sounds like, uh, contrary to what, what I might have read or thought, Maybe it wasn't the biggest deal in the world with your with your folks, but it was with you. Uh, when did you first have that feeling that music was important to you in a way that it wasn't for other people around you? Well, what what I what I realized when I was young is that I realized that I needed it. It wasn't like I was looking for it for some some kind of savior. If I didn't have have it, I felt uncomfortable if it wasn't there. So, and I and I and I was wasn't on a track to like become. A musician, that's what I was going to do in life for you. I didn't, I never thought that way until I had been doing it for about 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're too down, too far down the track to turn around. I know the feeling. No. Uh, um, so you said there wasn't too much money around to, to, to buy instruments or anything like that early on. What, what did you end up getting first uh, to play? What I got first was a trumpet, but I got that. Uh, through the, I uh, was a rental, and then um, I kind of blew it with the trumpet. <laughs> no pun intended. I got a guitar. I got a guitar about two years later, and I hung onto the guitar. But then I started playing steel drums. I never owned a steel drum. I just own my first steel drum now. Actually, I have one now. But uh, I, but I, but I had access to the drum, you know. And in school, a French horn was supplied for me, so. Some kind of way, I was I found instruments even though I didn't didn't have one. So it sounds like you sp- you said you sp- spent about fifteen years in the game before you realized this is what you were doing for a yeah. living. What did those first uh, fifteen years look like? Like how did you how did you first crack in? How did you kind of uh, uh, start walking down this road to do it professionally? Well, I think the first thing was that when when um the first band I was in was was um outside of school, my schoolmates, you know, was when I started playing with Papa John Creech, you know, and uh, that was in the early seventies. And, uh, and I was out on the road and then I was playing, I had my own instruments, my own amp, my own stuff. I even had a sure PA system. So <laughs> I was rocking. <laughs> what did that, what did touring look like in, in the early seventies like that? Were you guys going around doing a, a sp- Club circuit? Or were you doing theaters? Where, where were you playing? It was clubs, some theaters, rental cars, you know, uh, and a van. Two rental cars and a van going down the road, trading off on who's driving. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sounds like no sleep, but it also sounds like a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, yeah. 
It was crazy. I don't know why Papa John did it. That's why they took us out. We were like young. We were so bad. <laughs> what was one? Of, what was one of your favorite clubs on that circuit to play? Uh, place on Long Island called my father's place. It was always fun. You know, uh, uh, Long Island is a big island, I guess. But you know, I thought it was kind of small, but. I, I didn't know it was 100 miles long, but it was, it was on Long Island. It was called my father's place. It was outside of New York. And uh, that was place. And also a place in Connecticut called the Shabu Inn in mm -hmm. Connecticut. It was really a great place to play. So now when musicians go and play clubs, it, it can make sense. You can get people out to clubs because the internet really allows like lots of different micro audiences and you can get a hold of people. Back then, how were you getting audiences to come out to nightclubs? Well, um, that wasn't my department. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of way, Papa John, being a member of the uh, Jefferson Starship, you know, kind of got people out. He had he had a little swagger and he had a name for himself, so that's what it was. I, mean, I thought we were kind of big time, but we weren't. We weren't big time, but it felt like big time with a plan. Yeah. That's that's the most important part that it, it at least feels like it did. Uh, we had hotel rooms. <laughs> well, that's a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> no no couches is a big deal. Uh, what what did you learn um, from those tours? Like, what did you learn about musicianship uh, from those tours, or or just about life that that you wouldn't have learned had you not done that circuit? I think I got to travel. The biggest thing about that time was musically. Yes, musically, it was a great experience. But I got to travel because prior to that, I'd never been out of the state of California. So I was going to all these states. I was going down south, going to the northeast, you know, going to Colorado, going to Seattle and, you know, Portland, San Francisco. And so I got to witness people in other areas outside of Los Angeles. So to me, it was like traveling the world. Yeah. Did your, uh, what did your family think about you becoming an itinerant musician, just traveling the country, playing clubs like that? Oh, uh, they, as long as I was working, they weren't worried. But when I wasn't working, they would ask me when I was going to get a real job. <laughs> and, uh, I guess I never did get a real job. I still don't have a real job. <laughs> yeah. And thank God for that. <laughs> But, but, you know, I'm just joking there, but my, my job is a real job. I, I think it's, I don't, uh, I, I, I really don't think of it as, um, it was real in the fact that it, I'm, I'm, I'm able to, uh-oh, I did something. What did I do? No, you still sound good. Okay, all right. Yeah, I was, um, I opened up a window with my Pro Tools. <laughs> Let's say that. <laughs> um, in, a, in a sense, they were they were always worried about me because you know you know I was just kind of run, living by the seat of my pants all the time, you know, all the time. So they were worried, but I was a boy. I have three sisters, and if I was a girl, they probably would have really been worried. But uh, I was the boy, so I could take risks and I could you know go around. I could manage through stuff. But um, you know, I just I, I I really just was having fun. In those early days, I didn't really worry about the future, and uh, that's been my my downfall and my upfall. I don't worry about the future, where mm -hmm. I'm going to be, and I just worry about what am I doing now. Um, do I have any? Do I have enough gigs on the books right now to get me through whatever's coming up? You know, yeah. And if I don't, you know, then I just. But the right now is always the best moment for me. You mentioned uh, a moment ago, and I kind of just wanted to to dig in a little bit more. In some ways, in one sense, you said that you never did get a real job, and then you kind of rethought that for a moment and said, well, no, this is a real job. Uh, in what ways has it been a real job for you? Well, the real job aspect came in after I got signed to Sony, and being Kevin Mo became a real job. I mean, the music is still the fun part, but, you know, you have to um, spend your time doing other things now. You know, there's... Writing songs, duh, <laughs> which right. I love to do. And there's uh, doing interviews, which I love to do. And <laughs> there's things you have to do. You have to talk. People want to talk to you, you know? Yeah. You kind of have to 
prepare things and people people want people want to talk to you. It's really nice, you know. So um I just I just I I I I don't I'm I'm kinda of lost for words. It's not a good time to be lost for words, but I think that first Kev Mo album came out in early mid nineties, like ninety four or something like that. So in the intervening years, before we even get to that, I, I do believe you spent some time as a staff writer for A and M. Is that correct? Yeah, I had I had various roles: uh, publishing demo guy, songwriter, um, doing things around there. And, uh, so where yeah, were you? Where were you doing that work? Was that was there some of that work in L.A. or were you in Nashville or New York? Where were you when I you were doing that? In the late seventies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then in the late seventies, and I would come in every morning, at least three days a week. I was in the studio doing demos for a, for a publishing company, you know, Irving Elmo and and uh, publishing, and uh, and I got my studio chops together in there. Uh, I learned how to like you know just uh, how the whole thing worked, you know. So it was. Uh, you know, I don't know. I was, it was, uh, I mean, I already kind of knew how it worked, but then I really got to know how it worked in, in there with the songwriting and how to run a session and how to produce a recording, you know, and, uh, and all of the above. Did you have any mentors in there who were teaching you the ropes or did you have to teach yourself? Well, the environment was teaching me. It's just that, you know, you're working with different songwriters. Sometimes they were there, sometimes they weren't. Working with singers. Working with musicians, working with uh, engineers, and mixing, uh, getting sounds uh, and whatnot, and uh, it just the environment just taught you. And you look at the results. If you weren't getting the results you wanted, you had to figure out why you weren't getting them. Yeah. And so, yeah. so it sounds like you were being called on to do. I mean, that just sounds like a producer's role at that point. If you're having it, you were probably playing on those things, arranging them dealing with all, you know, the engineers, the mix engineer, stuff like that. Uh, was it basically a producer's role you were doing? I, was, I had a, was a producer there. I was kind of the uh, co-producer on that. Un, un, he was producer, but I was doing a lot of the work, was the, the getting things together. But he had the producing skills in terms of he hired me. So, you yeah. Know, you, you, that's producing. <laughs> I, I don't disagree yeah just hire the right people You're, you'll be in good shape so, so I, I got to work very closely with him you mm. know and hands on where he could just do his thing and, and listen and make sure everything was right and I, my job was to make sure things were going and he could comment on it you know but I was listening to everything that was going on at the same time and so I was it was, it was, it was, it was like going to a, a little three year college course actually you know yeah. Yeah. Except you don't have to go into debt to do it. So even better, you know. Uh, so what did you learn at that point about arranging? Like what is the most important part or some of the most important parts about arranging a new song? Uh, I found out that I knew more than I thought I did about how music goes together. <laughs> I found that I really naturally know how things work together musically, sound wise and parts and whatnot. So I just, you know, I mean, at that point, I had been playing for the last, yeah, what was that? Almost had 20 years under my belt by that time, you know. Mm-hmm. So playing from being a kid, you know, to playing, playing gigs from 12 years old to 28, 29, you know, so. So it sounds like you were just sort of discovering that you had an intuition that, that worked very well or, or a skill set. What were you having to do with songwriters and musicians in those sessions um, to get things to sound the way that you wanted them to sound? They pretty much let me do what I wanted to do. I mean, it was, it was, I was really operating on instinct. It, it was, it was, I mean, I really didn't, you know, I was, they trusted me, you know, to do my thing. And I had it in terms of why I was like, well, well, the producer called me. I had to call people, the right musicians to be in there, you know. So I learned it was about who I called and how I handled it and my ability to communicate the ideas and write the, have the right charts written for, for the, the deed to go down at the session, 
and had to go down in three hours. We had to get two tracks, you know, uh, three hours, and we had to get uh, two vocals. <laughs> that last point is the, the sticking point, I'm sure, most of the time. How close, in your mind now, when you work, how close is arranging to songwriting for you? Like when you're writing a song, it, do you start with an arrangement in mind or you're just purely writing a song and then you figure out the arrangement later? How intertwined are those things for you? Uh, it goes in different levels of discovery. First of all, the song gets written and that's more about the melody, uh, the lyrics, and thirdly, the chords. You know, the chords are the, 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 you know, the, the um, you know, the backbone of the, the mel that the melody sits on, but the melody and the words and the story are a big thing. Uh, so when I'm arranging um, the song, maybe the song gets written, but it doesn't get arranged. You know, sometimes you get lucky in the arrangement that you do while you're writing the song is it, but then sometimes it's not, and you can it's better. You can get get, get you can get at it later on. Um, I was watching the ABBA. Abba special, you know, I think I was talking about how they started with the melody, they started with the, uh, you know, something special, trying to find something that was catchy. So sometimes you don't find that while you're writing the song, but nonetheless, whether you find it at the beginning or find it later, you have to find it. So, and that was later on, like now, now, oftentimes I don't really trust, this, I don't really trust the um, parts that are being written in terms of the, um, you know, the song, I, tr I trust the lyrics and the melody and the arrangement can come later. And arranging is just, you're always arranging. The melody is an arrangement, you know, the, the, everything's an arrangement. So I don't, I don't really have a thing where I think one's separate from the other. It's uh, the arrangements, the, the roadmap, what, what comes next. Is there two bars out? Is there like a little break here? Or, the arrangement. So I, I really, I, and I'm just discovering this. Why you ask me this question now? Because no one really asked me about arranging in that sense. Right. Uh, but I, but I do arrange. I can arrange things. I can sit in the room. And I like when I do horns and horn sessions. I don't like really hire someone to write horns. I just have the horns come over. It drives them nutty. You know, <laughs> just come over. We're gonna do some horns, and I feed them parts. You know, yeah. based on in the room how it sounds in the room. You know, no, uh, I think that should be a Force that up one more, you know, do that, this, that, and, and well, so it's kind of crazy, but I can, I know what's supposed to happen oftentimes. Sometimes I'm opposed by, you know, the horn players may go like, well, I don't know, man, that's not going to work, man. That's not really a horn part. I know, just play it, just humor me, play it. And they go, oh, <laughs> you, know, you know, yeah, because, you know, you have pre preconceived notions about what things are, so. You know, if you're, if you're arranging in front of someone, they're going to have opinions about what it's going to be. And that's okay. That's good because sometimes you need that too, you know. But most times I kind of know where it needs to go, you know. If I, and if I, if, I, if I need help, I'll accept the help. Well, if you know where it should go and you're saying sometimes it can make musicians uncomfortable to do it on the fly and, and take it in directions that they maybe had preconceived notions about, how do you, as a kind of a band leader, how do you gain the trust of musicians to get them to follow you there? That's a good question. Um, you have to you have to do parts enough times that they think won't work that work. You know, it's trial and error. It's by like it's a trust building relationship, like a marriage or a, you know a friendship. You, know, you have to build the trust into the relationship where people start trusting you. Got it. So you got to you got to post some wins early on. <laughs> That's what yeah, you're saying. To tell you a win is just you know it's it's really uh, it's a dance too. Like you you have to uh, listen to the, the the protester, you know, <laughs> you know as well too, because you know at the same time you don't you only get so big headed that you're closed minded. Other right. right, yourself, you're still listening, but you also I have to understand that my idea. Is is the one that's going to fuel it, not because I'm better. I have better ideas, but it's my idea and it becomes more me. Mm. You know, so it's like you know the individual, my individual DNA gets in there. So uh, I think that's a big part of it because we're all unique. 
Like the way you do an interview is unique from the way, you know, any other, you know, journalist, mm -hmm. an engineer, do it, do it, do it, do it, an interview. So you have to do it the way you want to do it. And then I have to fall in and be there. <laughs> Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the Internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. Talking to Keb Mo at this stage of his career is a great honor, and it's also very insightful, because in some ways, he's above the fray now. He's able to look back on different creative choices that he made and different business decisions that he made and actually have some perspective on them. What a gift that is. And there's a wonderful poem by the poet Kathy Mangan about this kind of perspective. It's entitled, Above the Tree Line. Only the tenacious reach this summit cone, scoured to stone by eons of wind and rain, that I have climbed to this day in my own time, trying to surmount something human. I intended to carry only what I could bear with ease, yet I've hauled my tethered heart one half mile straight up through densities of sun-doused birches, fountains of ferns that swept my knees, clasped evergreens, then scrambled over palm-rasping rocks, past stunted pine and scrub, and chalky anonymous berry bushes, up to the gray, pocked surface of this enormous glacial brain in whose corrugations thistle and lichen sprout. Strangely, seeing birds circling overhead, I don't yearn for flight or any fanciful freedom. The world below is mine, though ruthless. I lean into the breeze sweeping 75 miles from the sea, anchored by an earthly sorrow rooted in grief, the ground that will never give way. So one of the most interesting things about your career is that, you know, that first Keb Mo album doesn't come out till almost the mid nineties. I think it was 94. Um, your co career completely changes at that point. How did that album come together and how did you kind of step from uh, the, you know, the, the arranging room and, and working from A&M to, to being in the footlights yourself? Um, how did that whole project come together and, and what did it feel like for you? But in the early 80s, I was awakened to something that I'd already knew about for a long time was the blues. Yeah. So when I started to dig deeper into the blues, um, 
my music changed, my music sensibility changed, and all of a sudden being real became very much important. Uh, I didn't write very many songs in the 80s. I wrote probably more in the 70s than I did in the 80s. <laughs> but but I, I was, because after after about 83, I kind of like, um, I threw in the songwriting towel and just started doing gigs, playing gigs. But then I caught the blues bug and I realized what was wrong with my songs before is they didn't have no soul. You know? And when I say soul, I don't mean like, you know, riff it or something like that. I mean, they, didn't have, they didn't have any authenticity. Very few of them had authenticity to it. There was nothing under there. There was no backbone. No. And I found that the blues, if it had anything, it had nothing else, it had a backbone. You know, a really serious backbone. So I started to follow that. I got on that trail. I became like a hound dog sniffing out of, you know, <laughs> catching, you know, a rabbit or something, you know. Uh, and I just started to look for that. And you know, as, as, by the time, you know, the Sony deal came up, which was a result of that hunt for realism, that hunt for truth through the blues and taking all my other aspects of my life and of music into, into um, consideration. 1993, uh, Kevin Moore was recorded in the month of November and it, came, it was released in June or July of 94. Yeah. That, was, that was the turning point was that, that six years before you know that record came out when did you realize with that record that it was going to be a turning point and that it was going to work that the work that the record had caught people's ears it had caught the zeitgeist um was there a moment when you knew like hey man this is gonna work well i think i knew it worked after like about, it was out about 12 years, you know, and it, and it went gold after 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> Only gold record. 12 years, I've sold 500,000 records of that record. That's my only gold record. You yeah. know, of course, you know, like gold records like that became a thing in the past very quickly. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, so, but, but it had consistently sold 1,000 records a week for 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's when I said, oh, this thing kind of caught on. Still thinking, well, it didn't go platinum, but gold ain't bad. <laughs> Man, <laughs> no. gold's, no, gold's, gold will do for sure. Uh, but surely, I mean, even before then, I mean, you start to uh, accrue all these accolades, you, you win Grammys uh, for your work. I mean, what did that, did it almost feel surreal given that you had spent 15 or 20 years kind of uh, uh, working in the trenches in a way, and then to be thrust into the spotlight and have things go so swimmingly? Well, I think I was ready. I think as a person, uh, I had done the work so that, you know, I didn't think that things were going all that great. I didn't think they're going bad, but it didn't mean anything. So what meant to me, what meant something to me was that what I was doing was being effective to the people that were hearing it. That's what meant something to me. The fact of how many people it reached didn't really mean anything to me. I just wanted whoever heard it to be some kind of way affected by it, by it. And the backbone of that record would shine through and that it would it could continually be a part of a, so and that's a, a music of that. In that sense, I think I achieved the goal. Did I achieve the biggest uh, success of a pop star? No, not really. But I, I achieved the kind of success that was satisfying to me in a sense and the goal of it i had in music because you know prior to that you know my sense of success was more about um how many records did you sell how much money did you make you know do you have a bmw no you <laughs> you know it was it was about the um the outside the look of success you know the feel of success the house you know the babes, the whole thing, you know what I mean? It's like that. But, you know, after somewhere around in the late 80s, I got in touch with the blues. Really, I was getting in touch with myself at the same time, too. All that stuff went away. And I just really awakened my love for music and, and accepted that I loved music. And that's why I was still in the game. That's why I was still there, not for the success. Because at 39, 40 years old, you know, it's pretty clear that success had passed me by, you know. So 
Why am I in it now? I'm in it because I love it. And that's when the success came. In, in what ways were those two pursuits intertwined? Your pursuit of uh, this authenticity in the blues and then your pursuit, you mentioned you were getting to know yourself as well. Um, how were those two pursuits intertwined? Well, I think the one pursuit, the primary pursuit of, um, of just making authentic music and being in it because that's who you are and that's what I do. The other one just kind of takes care of itself. Yeah. yeah. I get that. So how, how do you, what's your, how much do you think about, uh, because with the blues, you're taking this art form that has been around for a really long time. And in, in some ways you are now, uh, you end up becoming like the standard bearer for it, you know, in, in American culture. Um, but also, you've always pushed boundaries within that genre. So how do you navigate that? You're, you're working within this tradition, which is just that. It, it's traditional. And yet, to be an artist, you have to kind of, you have to buck against some of those boundaries as well. Like, how do you navigate that balance? Well, that's a very good question. Um, when I look back, I know probably if I had to stay on the course of the uh, first album, Kev Mo album that I would probably have created uh, a trench of um, consistency that would have served me maybe a little better. But at the same time, it would have bored me to tears. Uh, <laughs> you know? So right. again, the, my love of what I do is what I always lead with. And I know that if I change something, whatever I do different, it's going to have to be good. You know, I'm going to still have to put my best foot forward. So it's more about putting my best foot forward. So when I shock someone and do something that they're not expecting, at first they don't like it, you know. And I saw this happen with, with, with John Mayer, because I like, I love John Mayer. And, and he had made the continuum, you know, those beggars been that before. And, and then Battle Studies came out and I listened to it. And I, and I said, what is this? I was like, oh. And I realized after and six months later, I picked it up and I loved it. I got yeah. caught up in continuing. I got caught up in what I was listening to, and I wanted to have that again. But he changed the script, and eventually I went with him. So, um, but this is after the fact that I've been doing that myself. You know, but actually, I found myself being the victim of a um, you know artist, you know, pigeonholing an artist myself. So um, that was kind of a lesson to me. Oh, oh, yeah, this is what happens when you change up it upsets people right it's funny that's kind of a live by the sword die by the sword moment for you because it, it was that sort of pursuit of authenticity that leads to that first album keb mo but then as as you continue to follow that you're saying that it led you in a place that you now kind of question uh the, the commercial wisdom of doing so but if you know kind of sounds like you were uh, in for a dime in for a dozen at that point and I'm always okay with failing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had enough failure that, you know, I became comfortable with failure. So, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, successful people who say, if you're not failing, you're not succeeding. You know, so I became very comfortable with like, well, this is probably a flop. So first it had to succeed with me. If I like it. If I'm comfortable with it, and I think I did my best work and I like it, that's enough. That's where it's from. You've accomplished so much over the last 50 years of music, and you're still out here creating original work when a lot of artists would be content to stay home, not tour, or, or if they were going to, to just do a greatest hits tour without new music out. What continues to inspire you to create? Oh, I still have to work for a living. <laughs> I never, I never, I mean, I didn't make the kind of big, I mean, I did okay, you know, but, you know, I didn't make that U2 money where, you know, what you can, <laughs> well, should we go on tour? I don't know. Let's just take another year off. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know. I could take, you know, a year off. I mean, a two year, two, five years. No, well, well now, wait a minute. Hold on, buddy. <laughs> totally. So really, I, I still have to work for a living. And, um, um, I just, um, 
I, I like it. I mean, I like what I do, and and and, 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 and I, I like me, you know. I, I, I like I like me. I, I'm, you know, um, that's one thing that like rejection does for you. You have to face yourself, and you've been rejected or you failed. You have to look at yourself in the mirror and go, "Are we still in this? We still gonna do it?" And we go, "Okay, let's go." <laughs> And you strap your guitar on and you go back out there. <laughs> well, that that sounds like a plan to me. Thanks so much for coming on to the Working Songwriter Podcast. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Keb Moe's latest single is entitled Good Strong Woman featuring Darius Rucker, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.